Today's one of those messages where I'm going to answer a lot of questions that some of you have today. For some of you, today is going to be one of the most informational sermons you've ever heard. So I'm going to encourage you to grab your notes and don't just write down the, uh, the, the answers for the blanks. I would take copious notes today uh, because we're going to talk about joy in death. And it's one of those, it's one of the messages that is in order for me to get where we have to go, I need to give you a lot of information to get there. And uh, so will you promise me that you'll hold on today? Because this is going to be good. So grab the person next to you and say, Pastor Paul said this is going to be good. And I believe him. Okay? So hang with me. We'll be a little longer than normal, and I apologize for that. But I think when we get to the end of today's message, you'll be glad that we took the time to dig into this. Thank you, Lord, for what you have planned for us today. This whole week, as I've been studying and preparing myself for this message, Lord, I've just sensed that there are those that have had so many questions about what happens after death. That today is going to be a seminal moment for them, and it's going to clarify, it's going to bring clarity to a lot of questions and maybe misconceptions that they've had. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, I just pray that you would come into this place, give us ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. Let us understand that the Word of God is truth and it's life, and that you have something you want to say to us today. And so we open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to understand what the Spirit's saying today. In Christ's name, amen. Subject of death is one of the few things that every human has in common. Regardless of race, intellect, social standing, what country you were born in, the state or town that you were born in, we all have this one common denominator firmly fixed in our reality, and that is this. You and I are going to die. That's a great way to start a sermon, isn't it? The Bible explains the reason for death. That God is the God of the living. He is a living God. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created us in his image and his likeness. And part of that is that we are to live. And that sin was our turning our backs on God, our disconnecting from him. And in so doing, we have now been separated from the God who is the giver and the author of life. And the result is that we are all born spiritually dead, and ultimately we face physical death. Let me give you just a little bit of Bible background on this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God says, If you sin, if you eat of the fruit, you will die. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 12, death has spread to all because of sin. Did you know that every hour more than 6,000 people die? In the time that we will spend here together today, 6,000 people will go into eternity. Despite the reality and the eminency of death, we have a hard time accepting it, don't we? I want you to think of the very first time that you were confronted with death. For me, I was about... I want to say I was about 11 years old. My great uncle Jimmy, who used to come, he was blind. And after uh, he'd become blind, family members had to take care of him. So my dad really cared for his uncle, and he would have him come, and he would spend a month or two with us every summer. So the very first time that I was really confronted with death was when my great uncle Jimmy died. Then when I was 19, 20 years old, one of our best friends, one of mine and Lori's best friends, she was the maid of honor in our wedding. She was killed in a car accident. It's really the first time that I really, really knew somebody. I remember how nervous and anxious I was the day of her wake. 
being confronted with the reality of death. You may be able to remember that first occasion when someone close to you was probably a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a family member, or someone down the street was killed tragically, and you could think of that moment and you remember. The greatest fear for most of us is the fear of the loss of either our spouse or our children. And it's because we have this tendency or this, this natural inclination to want to protect and to preserve and to keep them and to care for them. And so we, we kind of worry about it and we fear the loss of our children or our spouse. As a matter of fact, I was kind of confronted with this a little over a week ago when my wife called me from the emergency room in Danbury. She was a bit groggy, and she said to me, I'm in the emergency room. And I said, are you kidding? Or, no, honey, I was in a car accident. I remember that, that gripping fear that I had in that moment. I said, are you okay? She said, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Whew. Kind of that release. You don't know what's going on in that moment. It's the fear all of us have. Because we're a church and most everybody here is very young, I have to be honest, I talk to my other friends who are pastors and they're talking about all the funerals they're doing and I say, I haven't, I haven't done a funeral in over a year. I do a lot more weddings than I do funerals because our church is so young. And as time goes on and as we grow older as a church, more than likely I'll be here to preside over some of your funerals. I'd rather preside over yours than you preside over mine, quite honestly. Kind of selfish that way. We as a, as a society do everything we can to avoid death, don't we? Even our nightly news won't show the horrific pictures of dead bodies because it's so disconcerting. It's too graphic. We placed our loved ones when they're dying. It's a trend change for our society. We now take our loved ones and we put them in homes or we put them in hospitals to die. It used to be that our loved ones would die at home surrounded by their family. Now we do everything we can to make them comfortable as they're passing from this life to the next. But it used to be Years ago, quite honestly, and some of you are old enough probably to remember this, that your, your family members would die at home, and it actually wasn't this peaceful, wonderful thing. It was a little bit more traumatic than how we know death today because we do everything we can to make it easier. Death for us, listen to me, as we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, death for us is an enemy. We can't accept death. We don't embrace it. We fight it. We do everything we can to prolong the inevitability because as image bearers of our creator, we choose life and we long for life. Listen, that is a God-given inclination in our lives. That's why the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that eternity is set in the heart of of man. Every single one of us realizes or at least has a concept that there's something after death. And that's because God has written that and placed that in our hearts. The result is that various philosophies and religions have risen up to try to answer the question as to what lies on the other side of death. There are a few schools of thinking, and I want to share just a couple of them with you this morning. The first one is a category that we're going to call, we all win. And we kind of like that category, don't we? First, teaching under this, or religious mindset under this is called universalism. And it, can I tell you right off the bat, I want to say this, this is a, a, a horrendous lie from the pit of hell. It states that we all go to heaven. When you die, when your loved ones die, you'll go to heaven. Frankly, this morning, it's a lie that we tend to tell others when we don't know what else to say. We say things like, well, at least they're in a better place. And the truth is that may not be reality. 
That's simply not true for everyone. Jesus, listen, Jesus speaks about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. Jesus himself talks about the reality of hell. Another teaching is annihilationism, which is also false. And it says this, it says that we all cease to exist after death. You die and that's it. There's nothing else after death. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 speaks to both of these options when it states there is eternal life and there is eternal death. That those who are cursed will live um, in eternal death while those who are blessed live eternal life. Those who sleep in the dust, it says, of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Listen this morning, the question is not will we live forever, the question is where? The second category we're going to call is we all get a second chance. And let me add just a little bit to it. We all get a second chance to win. The first form of this teaching is kind of familiar to a lot of us. We know it as reincarnation. Yeah, you remember that one. After you die, you re-enter the world. You get to come back if you're lucky as a cow in India. So much about that I just could do without, right? You re-enter the world and you may go through life after life after life after life until you get it right. And then you go to heaven. The Bible never speaks to nor does it allude to any form of this teaching. The Bible never talks of a second chance to atone for your sins. A, very, a variation of this teaching is found in some sects of Christian, Christendom, and it's called purgatory. Purgatory is when you die, you get to go to a waiting place between heaven and hell, and you suffer there in order to atone for your sins. It's kind of a, well, it's not kind of, it's a second chance to go to heaven. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28 negates both of those theories when it states, it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin. Let me say that again. Christ is not coming again to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Let me say emphatically, there is no second chance. Not really under this, but kind of in its own category here, is something that's called soul sleep. And I found out recently that this has actually been taught in this church by someone in one of our other groups. And let me tell you something, I want to dispel that right now. This belief is that upon death, a Christian doesn't go to heaven or hell. Instead, their soul goes into an unconscious state and their soul goes to sleep to await the resurrection. The Bible negates that in our text that we're going to read in a few moments. In Philippians chapter 1, it says this, To live is Christ, to die is gain. What he doesn't say is that to live is Christ and to die is to go take a nap for a couple of years. To live is Christ, to die is to just hang out for a while while your soul sleeps. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says to be absent from the body is to be present. Present tense with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When you die, you're absent from your body, your soul is with the Lord. He doesn't say to be absent from the body is to take a nice long nap. What's interesting about these teachings, these teachings that state that we all win or we all get a chance to win is that there's no other major religions, I was thinking about this, that state the opposite. There's no other major religions out there that say we all lose when we die. Anyone who know someone who goes to a church like that that says, you know, when we all die, we all go to hell. Anybody want to sign up for that church? No? Actually, in some ways, it would almost be more biblical than some of these other teachings because we're all born into sin, right? 
We all mess up all the time. The fact that there are no major teachings to that effect speaks to the fact that there's something within all of us that believes in or strives for or yearns for, if you will, eternal life. For life that keeps going and that death is not the end. We all kind of believe, don't we, that we deserve heaven. Amen? Amen. Still with me? Everybody with me? Okay, because I see some of you nodding off. Am I boring? Because no. I'll dance up here. I'll put a clown's nose on. No? Okay, hang with me. Here's what Scripture does teach about what is waiting for us on the other side after death. First of all, in your notes, the Bible teaches that we all consist of two parts. We call the body or the physical and the soul what we know to be true about another person that we can't see. The body, what you can't see, the physical and the soul. Now, we could debate a third part, but for, our, but for our purposes this morning, I want to make it as simple as I can so we understand. The body, what you see, what you touch. Go ahead and pinch the person next to you because I want to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. Okay? Make it hurt. Leave bruises. Okay? That's good teaching right there. That's the physical. Now do this. That's the soul you're talking to right there. I see you, right? We know someone. We know them. We understand them. We, we get it, but we can't see it. That's the soul. Now, at death, your body and your soul will be separated. The body goes into the grave, as we all know. We bury that. In our funeral services, we talk about the seed that is planted. And the soul continues to live. The question then is, where is the soul when the two are separated? Where does it go? Jesus explains that in a story he tells in Luke chapter 16. He explains a holding place with two destinations. And that there is a chasm in between these two destinations that keep them completely separated. That no one can cross from one to the other or from the other to the one. The first one is called paradise. The second is Hades. Now, I want to talk about paradise first this morning. Those saints who are waiting for Jesus, they are waiting for the Messiah God's son to die in their place and thus secure their salvation. They died in faith waiting for Jesus the Messiah. These would include the Old Testament saints like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Moses, David, Joshua. In addition to them, there were godly women like uh, Sarah and Rahab and Ruth and Esther. These people died waiting for and longing for the Messiah. They were waiting for Jesus to come. And when they died, their bodies went into the grave while their soul went to this place called paradise. This was a place of joy. It was a place of peace. And it was a holding uh, place until Jesus died. He rose again and he ascended to heaven. When he ascended to heaven, this place, paradise, was opened up after sin had been atoned for. So Jesus comes. Jesus is God in a man suit. He lives life without sin. He goes to the cross. He substitutes himself in our place for our sins. He pays the penalty of death for our sins. And he tells us that on the cross, he's going to a place called paradise. If you remember, on the cross, there were two thieves. One is giving Jesus a hard time. The second one says, do you not know who this is? Don't you understand who you're talking to? And Jesus turns to that man and he says, today you will be with me where? In paradise. He doesn't say we're going to heaven. He doesn't say we're going to Hades. He doesn't say we're going to Applebee's. You are still awake. You're with me. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Why was this man going to be in paradise? Because he had proclaimed his faith in Jesus and he had acknowledged who Jesus was. Can I tell you today, if you've never proclaimed Jesus as Savior and Lord, you can do that today, just as that man on the cross did. 
And he had the assurance of eternal life with Jesus at that moment. Jesus then dies. His body goes into the tomb. His soul goes to paradise, paradise, just like he told us. He is there for three days. After those three days, Jesus is resurrected and his soul re-entered his body. And he was physically raised to life. Now, I want you to know this. Jesus' uh, resurrection was the pattern of our resurrection that our soul and our body are disconnected at death, but they are reconnected at the resurrection. There's going to be a day, Scripture tells us, when the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive and yet remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with those. It says that those who have died, their body, just like Jesus, is going to be resurrected, their soul and their body are going to be joined together again. In heaven, for eternity, we're not going to just be souls after Christ comes, the second coming. We're going to be joined together. We're going to be both soul and body. Jesus is resurrected because he had no sin. When one dies, a sinner, um, a sinner, there is no resurrection. Let me say this. There'll be no resurrection. Death is the final stop for the unrighteous. However, when one has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and they die, death has no hold on them. That's good news, isn't it? Death has no hold on them. Jesus then, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, walked around the earth for 40 days so that everyone would have an opportunity to see him and attest to his bodily resurrection. And then he returned to heaven. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, quoting one of the Psalms that prophetically announced that Jesus would take captives with him on his train to glory, meaning that once Jesus had died and was risen and taken away, uh, has taken away sin, that he ascended into heaven, thereby opening heaven um, to sinners that had claimed Jesus Christ as Lord, right? Because he had paid the price for their sins. He took with him all of those that were in paradise. So he is raised again to life. He spends 40 days at that moment when he ascends to heaven in the book of Acts. Guess what? Heaven is open and all of those in paradise go with him into heaven. They are no longer in paradise. Today they are with Jesus in heaven. So today there is no one waiting in paradise. Paul explains in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, for those who die who are Christians, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, that your soul goes to heaven to be with Jesus. Jesus tells us in the gospel, he says, I go to prepare a place for, for you, that where I am, there you may be also. We will spend eternity with Christ. Anybody else excited about that? Yeah. Okay. That's paradise. Now, for those who die in faith apart from Jesus, their soul goes to that holy place called Hades that is still occupied today. And that is where they will remain until hell is finally opened up. Hades is occupied at this very moment by people who have died. I want you to know that Hades is a place of torment. Jesus used this picture to describe Hades in Luke chapter 16 in the same story that he talks about paradise. Jesus is emphatic that it is a place of torture, a place of burning, a place of discomfort. He uses the words wailing and gnashing or grinding of teeth because of the pain and the torment of unrepentant sinners under the hand of a holy, righteous, just, and good God. Jesus makes it clear that if you died and have not received Christ's forgiveness and atonement for your sins, that this is where your soul would go. It's a place of unyielding, unending, unrelenting, and eternal torment. Additionally, you will see on the day of judgment none other than Jesus Christ. And to be clear, Revelations 20, 13, and 14 states, and the sea shall give up its dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That's hell. This is the second death and the lake of fire. So it's not until the very end of time that hell will be opened up. 
This is when your body and your soul will be rejoined to stand before Christ. Not as a second chance, but as a pronouncement of judgment. I want to stop here for just a moment, and I want to say this to you now. No one will stand before Jesus and ask for a retrial. No one will contest their judgment when it happens on that day. They will stand before a holy and just God, and they will know that they are condemned rightly. I want to state that we have gotten away from this correct teaching that reminds us that there is a real heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. Some of you here today may wonder why I've talked about hell today. You may wonder what hell has to do with Jesus because we've been told Jesus is good and Jesus is happy and Jesus is Santa Claus. First, let me say this. Life is short in comparison to eternity. If you feel like life is a long time, you're not going to feel that when you stand before God and understand that you have eternity. The Bible is clear, as I've demonstrated, that death is final and eternity weighs in the balance from what you do in this life. Second, as I stated earlier, Jesus speaks about hell more than he does heaven. And he speaks about hell more than any other person in all of Scripture. That means that it was important to Jesus for us to know. One of the ways Jesus refers to hell is by the name of Gehenna. That term is used uh, 12 times in the New Testament. Of those 12 times, 11 of those are by Jesus. I want to give you some background to this term. And I want to explain this specifically because there's a teaching that's going around right now. And it's gained a lot of traction because it's been taught by someone who's become very prominent in the Christian world. And I'm not going to name him because I don't want you to go out and start reading this stuff. But someone, we even used their teachings at one point. They had some really good stuff. All of a sudden started teaching that there's no hell. That when Jesus was talking about this place of Gehenna, it was, and I'm going to explain it here in just a moment, he was talking metaphorically. Yes, he was talking metaphorically, but he's talking about metaphorically about a real place in order to give a picture that the people of Israel and for us today that we'd be able to understand. And so we want to be careful that we use Scripture correctly. As I said, Gehenna, it was used metaphorically. He was painting a picture that would be understandable for the people to whom he was speaking. Literally, however, Gehenna was a place outside of Jerusalem that had been used as a place for sacrifices to false gods. Most notably, it was a place where human sacrifices had taken place. And even worse, there were people that had sacrificed their children in this place of Gehenna, in this valley of Gehenna. Now, in Jesus' day, it was a place of derision, and it was avoided, and it was spoken of negatively. So what they did is they actually made Gehenna a dump outside of the city. And the refuge and the bodies that were thrown into this dump were actually burned. And the fire from Gehenna, they could see it from Jerusalem. It burned continuously. It never went out. Day and night, the smoke from the fire of Gehenna could be seen from the city of Jerusalem. Jesus explains that like Gehenna, the flames of hell would burn continuously. The fire will never go out. And like Gehenna, the smoke and the fire and the worms that were eating the decay and the rot would never cease. And you may wonder how Jesus could speak of such things. Let me explain that not only does he speak of hell, Jesus rules over hell. I want to expel a satanic myth that says that God rules over heaven and Satan rules over hell. That is incorrect. It's a lie. And it's found nowhere in Scripture. Jesus rules over all. Heaven and earth and everything under the earth are under his feet, Scripture tells us. Revelations 14, 10, and 11, we're given a glimpse of what is to come. And we're told that those in hell will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Check this out. Satan or his demons will be ruling over anything in hell. 
They will be punished and they will burn in hell as will unrepented sinners who refuse to acknowledge Christ as Lord. Folks, this is serious stuff. All of that to tell you this truth. I want you to catch this. If you are a Christ follower, this is as close, this life is as close to hell as you will ever get. And if you are not a Christ follower, this life is as close to heaven as you will ever get. That means for Christ followers, this life is as bad as it can possibly be. And for non-Christ followers, this life is as good as it could possibly be. Okay, all of that's my introduction. So poke somebody next to you. All that so you can understand the words of Paul that we're going to talk about this morning. Paul is a man who was acquainted with the reality of imminent death. As a matter of fact, Paul had escaped death a number of times before writing the book of Philippians. And now, at the writing of the book of Philippians, as we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, he is penning this book awaiting a death sentence. So I want to read to you uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 30, and this will be our text today. Paul says, I will continue, everybody say continue, continue. to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. Many of your Bibles read this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Would you say that with me? To live is Christ, to die is gain. That is the seminal verse of all of Philippians. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ. See what he says? He says, I don't long to go and have a nap. I long to go and be with Christ because when I die, I go to be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he's doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come to see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you've been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in the struggle together. You've seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. In verse 29, Paul tells us again, he reminds us again that suffering is part of the Christian faith. And he also tells us that suffering is to be embraced. We talked about that last week. The thesis statement of this chapter, as I said, comes from verse 21. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And what he means is that in this life we can experience and have a life with Jesus. We can have a life like Jesus. We can have a life that is in relationship and fellowship with Jesus. And that we can have a life that ends in Jesus. Paul is explaining that as long as we are alive, there is work for us yet to do. People to love, sins to repent of, truths to learn, tithes to pay, opportunities to serve, others to forgive, and opportunities for us to share the love of Christ with sick people, to love hungry people, and to feed those that are hungry. In other words, there are ways for us to demonstrate in this life 
and by our lives that have been marked by the love and the person of Jesus Christ. Folks, this includes our suffering. That our suffering, when given to God, has purpose. To die is gain means that in death we are in Christ, we are with him, that we are perfected in death. So to live is Christ for us to serve and to love and to reach out and to show compassion to. But to die is to be perfected. Richard Baxter, Baxter was only 30 years old and he was afflicted with ailments and was facing death. And instead of wasting away, he grabbed a concordance and a Bible and sketched out his own funeral. Going through the Bible and choosing scriptures on death, this Puritan minister scripted out his funeral sermon so that one of his pastoral friends could actually do his sermon. It's a pretty neat idea. Preach your own sermon, have somebody else, you know, give the words. And for five months, God prolonged his life. Even though he was in constant pain, what started out as a sermon turned into a rather lengthy book that has been shortened into a smaller book called A Saint's Everlasting Rest. In it, he writes that while meditating on Scripture, what he thought was his deathbed, because he ended up living a lot longer than this, he said that through Scripture, he understood that heaven is a place of three parts. That heaven is a place of perfection, heaven is a place of happiness, or we'll call joy, and that heaven is a place of rest. Throughout the book, he takes those three themes and he elaborates. First, that heaven is a place of perfection. That nothing in this world and no one in this world is perfect. Ecclesiastes states that everything that God made straight has, been, has become crooked through sin. And, it cannot, and, and that we, as humans, we cannot straighten it out because we are crooked. Only God can do that. And that heaven is perfect. Heaven is perfect health. Heaven is perfect relationships with other believers. Heaven is perfect understanding so we know fully who God is. That heaven is perfect harmony and peace. That heaven is a perfect world that is free of sin and disasters and sickness and wars and atrocities. And yes, even death. Secondly, Baxter concludes that for those who acknowledge Christ as Lord, there will be rest. Perfect and complete and absolute rest. And he takes that from the book of Hebrews, where rest is a continual theme of the book. You, like me, can identify with the constant, unceasing pressure for more. Maybe different for you, but for me, the constant pressure is to write more sermons, more people to meet and pray for, more finances to raise and, raise and more classes to teach, more meetings to attend, and the list goes on and on and on and on. You can identify with that. But Baxter notes that heaven is a place of continual rest, emotional, relational, spiritual, and physical rest. Heaven is described as a place where rest is complete, and absolute. There is no curse, no death. And listen, work is no toil in heaven. It doesn't say that we won't have things to do in heaven. We will have work, but it won't be toil. Thirdly, Baxter notes that heaven is a place of perfect joy. He uses the words of Paul in Philippians as he describes heaven as a place of unending, unceasing, unparalleled joy. Heaven is a place where there is no sickness or pain or wars or evil, no hatred, no death, no inequality, where the curse is forever broken. Let's be honest, we all long deep down for a place like that. We're constantly frustrated because no matter how many wars are fought, tears are shed or treaties are signed, we fall short and we're frustrated and we're empty and happiness and joy eludes all of us. So to live is Christ, to work towards that life is Christ, and to experience the fullness, the completion of Christ's work on the cross of Calvary, that's gain. Let me ask you this morning, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you love Jesus Christ? Have you experienced the forgiveness and the promise of eternal life? 
that he offers you today, that he offers you now? There are two facts that bind all of us together. They are irrefutable and they are absolute. The first one, as I said at the beginning of this message, is you will die. And the second is that you will stand before Christ one day. You will stand before him as either friend or you will stand before him as foe. You will stand before him as blessed or you will stand before him as cursed. And you may protest today and say that that's not fair. Why would God let us die just to spend eternity in hell? And I would respond to you today this way. First of all, that God is righteous. He is good, he is holy, and because of that, he must deal with sin and sinners accordingly. If you follow it logically, it's the only outcome. We are imperfect and we are sin-ridden and we cannot under any uh, circumstances understand the holiness of the complete and absolute holiness of God, nor can we as imperfect beings question it. Secondly, I would say to you that God is loving, he is patient, he is good, and he is kind. God himself came from heaven to earth and he took our punishment. He suffered for you and he suffered for me. He bore our sins and our shame in order that we could have eternal life, eternal peace, and eternal joy. To say that God is unfair is the greatest of hypocrisy. Because of Jesus, we all have the same assurance that Paul describes in our text today. That because of Jesus, life here on earth has purpose. It has meaning. And when we die, when I die, when you die, we have the wonderful promise and assurance that our death is gain. And I would say that instead of arguing with God and questioning him, I would accept his wonderful gift of eternal life that he has purchased on our behalf with the blood and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And always kind of cracks me up when people say that God's unfair. You're right. Can I tell you something? God is absolutely unfair. You heard it right here this morning, and it's absolutely true. God is unfair. Because if God were fair, none of us would have the option of heaven. God is absolutely unfair that he sent his son to die for you and for me so that we would even have a chance of eternal life. That's unfair. And anyone who thinks that God should be fair doesn't really understand how it works. The fact that a perfect, absolute, righteous God would spend one second loving, caring, even worrying about us for one moment is unfair. And yet, out of love and compassion, he offers every one of us eternal life. And we presume to look at God and not accept it that's ridiculous. You ever hold an ant in your hand when you were a little kid, right? You're going to squish it. Could you imagine having the power of life and death over that little ant? Saying, you know what? I care about this ant so much, I'm going to become an ant. In order that all antum Upon death, could go to Aunt Heaven and live in complete joy and peace for eternity. And that's even a small example of what God has done for us. If you're here today and you've never taken the time never really thought through all of this 
never considered it fully this morning. That Almighty God loves you that much. That He offers you eternal life. And today you'd say, I don't understand all of it. I don't get all of it. I want to. All I know is that if I there's a God that loved me that much. I want to know him fully. Today you can start a relationship with him. Today he can come and he can cleanse away all the sin and the imperfections and the wrong attitudes and all that stuff. Listen, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and just automatically be this other person, but I'll tell you this, you're going to have peace and you're going to have assurance of eternal life and you know what? There's going to be something in you that's going to want to know him more. And each day you're going to want to know him more. And we talk, we call that sanctification. You know how we know God more? We get more of us out. Less of Paul, more of God. My wife would like a whole lot less of Paul, okay? Less of Paul. God, that's sanctification. And each day we're getting to know him more because you know what? A little bit more of us dies. A little bit more of us is replaced with the nature of Christ. We become more like him. It's a process, isn't it, church? Like, oh my goodness, some days I go, man, alive, am I ever going to get any of this right? I mean, just one thing. Let me get one thing right. Maybe you'd want to start that kind of a relationship with you today.